Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher. This is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to share with you a conversation I had with my friend, Ann Bogle. She's back on the show this week to talk about her new book, Don't Overthink It, Make Easier Decisions, Stop Second Guessing, and Bring More Joy to Your Life. And if there's ever been one of those things that can maybe feel productive but you know it's really not. It's overthinking it. It's getting stuck in that spin cycle of thinking and overthinking instead of deciding and then acting and actually getting something productive done. In this conversation with Anne, we talk about how to deal with that, how to short circuit those pathways in our brains that cause us to overthink things, to recognize the triggers that start us up in that direction, to be less panicked, to stop getting stuck in a mental trap and actually be productive, but not just productive, at peace, having joy in our life, like the subtitle of the book says. So I'm going to get out of the way and just say, enjoy this conversation with Ann Bogle. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome back to the show, Ann Bogle. Ann, welcome back. Thanks for having me. The last time you, we, that we did talk, uh, we were talking about the book Reading People. There's so much in that book. And in fact, I'll throw the, the link to that episode in the show notes because we're not going to dive deep. But that was a really deep dive. You give me the synopsis. You're the author. What am I doing? Oh, well, in that one, I indulged my personality geekery and talked about how understanding yourself and others, like the way you operate, the way you meet the world, um, really can transform the way that you work, the way you live, the way you interact with others, the way you see yourself, the way you manage yourself. We're both self-employed. You know, Mm -hmm. that takes a lot of self-management. And when you understand the way that you naturally operate, whether that's for the good or for the crazy making, uh, you can do something about it. One of the best things about that was we we jumped from thing to thing to thing as it came to, you know, the Enneagram or uh, what were some of the, the, the five love languages. Uh, I'm I'm not thinking of all of them, but there there's so many different, you know, uh, ways that we as humans try to put each other in boxes to help us help ourselves understand ourselves and others and you know, sometimes with mixed results, but all of that was (laughs) positive. Yeah. All of that was positive talk because it was all about, you know, figuring out, uh, you know, knowing ourselves better, which is self-awareness, which is a huge theme on this show because only in that way and only in, you know, knowing ourselves, can we really get out of our own way and stop self-sabotaging ourselves when it comes to what we're trying to do. But then also those are the people that we work with or live with. Same thing. If it's hard enough to understand ourselves, how much harder is it to understand somebody who we're not in their head, you know? So so true. And yes, the first step to change is always awareness. And what I'm sure we've both seen over and over again is we assume that everyone approaches their life and their work the same way mm. we do. We don't realize that we just have one of many ways that we're operating from, uh, we tend to see our way as normal and realizing the all the different ways that we can approach our life and our work is really good. I feel like empathy is a huge buzzword right now, but really understanding the way someone else sees the world can really mean the difference between a fruitful relationship and one that makes everybody involved crazy. For sure. Yeah. And, you know, we we've heard this statement that I'm about to make uh, said a number of times in higher frequency since about 2016, where, well, in these day, in this day and age, everybody's so polarized and blah, 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 you know, on social media or in person. And, you know, it, usually they're talking about politics when that statement comes up, but it doesn't have to be just about that. It, and in fact, it predates that like crazy. You know, it's, it's, we always benefit from trying to figure out how others are thinking because everybody is thinking about things differently. It, we just, Somehow I'll get along, hopefully. (laughs) Very true. (laughs) So, but picking up from, you know, those themes from the last book of reading people and knowing people, knowing ourselves, making that all work in terms of the relationship we have with ourself, the relationship we have with others, moving into Don't Overthink It, the new book, uh, I just couldn't help but think this is almost a diving deeper into that theme. And I have to ask, like, what was that thought process of moving from that book to this one? Oh, of why I wanted to get back into people's heads. Yeah. Well, Eric, I am a person in the world and so many of my books are driven by the 
the issues that I think about that I'm compelled to understand or that I don't understand. And I want to write to figure out what I think. I mean, I got my public writing start as a blogger. And for a long time, I thought, oh, like I have this idea. I'm going to sit down and write what I know about it. And then I'll finish the post. But what I realized, it took me years to realize this, was that I wrote to figure out what I thought, or I wrote to discover something I needed to know, not writing what I already knew. And that is certainly the case here. I had no idea how much I did not know about overthinking. But as a person in the world who is a recovering perfectionist, and uh, I'm sure not the best overthinker, like, I don't know if I'm like metal level overthinker, but I certainly um, know my way around the three o'clock in the morning situation. Um, This is something I was just fascinated in. It's something I talked about with my friends. It's something I'd see in the media. And Uh, It was something I was interested in exploring for my own sake. And then just through my years talking with readers um, on the blog and in real life, I knew that I was not the only one who suffered from this issue and would love to know what to do about it. As I was going through the book, I couldn't help but feel like this is one, you hitting a real stride uh, in your writing first off. So thanks. Kudos there. And two, I think, again, you were leaning into that almost public self therapy aspect of <laughs> that authors kind of when they get into that it's like oh my gosh it's so relatable you know it's not always the most fun to like tell <laughs> your embarrassing stories on podcasts or in the pages of your book but it's i so appreciate it when other authors do that because when you can relate and when you can see how someone can put the information to work in their own life is different from yours as that may be it really helps me see how i can do the same in mine yeah I am curious and, you know, you can dive in anywhere here that you want to, but I guess I should probably reveal the the full title. I said, don't overthink it. But the rest of that title, the subtitle is, or the full title is don't overthink it, make easier decisions, stop second guessing and bring more joy to your life. And, you know, those three things are definitely in the wheelhouse of topics we've maybe fringe covered on this show before, maybe not with specificity uh, in a single episode. So I I am curious, though, uh, overthinking can take on many different forms. And and I am an overthinker. I know that in the book you state that, you know, more women overthink than men. And there's research to back that up. But I am one of those men. So. (laughs) Oh, you are far from alone. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, and, and I know that. I know that for sure. I know, I know another, I, I know another handful of, of men that I would say I, I throw in there. So, uh, over, overthinking, it, it just, it can take on so many different forms. So, I mean, what are some of those forms that, that it can take? What are some of the forms that one you <laughs> have experienced or that in the research for the book that you've come across? That's a great question. And it's one that I would answer totally differently now than I would have a few years ago, because in the course of researching the book, I mean, so spending a couple of years of your life deep diving the topic, um, I realized that overthinking was went a lot wider in a lot deeper than I had ever imagined. The current books that I could find that existed about this topic focused on one or two things, and that was rumination which is when your mind keeps returning to the same thought. The origin of the word is kind of gross. It's like a cow returning to your cut. That's where the the rumination comes from, from the ruminants. Um, And there are books about that. And then worrying, which is where you're focused on negative thoughts and a specific thing that you are fearful will or is happening. But I really wanted to go broader than that because the other ways that overthinking um, infiltrates your life is... We experience decision fatigue, which manifests as a general sense of overwhelm. And we experience analysis paralysis and second guessing. I was really surprised to find out in the course of researching this book how tied to overthinking perfectionism was. I did not see that connection before. But as someone who has struggled with perfectionism for much of my life, um, once I knew to look at my own experience through that lens, I could see everywhere how perfectionism drove overthinking. I also didn't perceive before the small ways that overthinking really affected my life on a day-to-day basis. Like if there was a change of plans, I would freeze. I had no idea how to be how to react to something spontaneously in the moment. Um, I didn't realize how I slipped into overthinking when I was tired or hungry on a regular basis. Um, 
And I didn't realize how much my habits and my general productivity practices could hinder or hamper my own overthinking. It just went a lot deeper than I expected. And the, so the subtitle, which is really funny because we debated about that for ages, um, stop overwhelm was a big question. Like, can we do that? Can we use overwhelm as a noun? And it brought me joy to see that you have in your podcast um, episodes, mm -hmm. overwhelm as a noun. Mm -hmm. And it's an important topic to discuss here, but that's, that's the camp I was in. So it's yeah. been in common usage since like 1957. So you are good. Not like you needed me to tell you that. But <laughs> but we know that overthinking is when your thoughts are repetitive, unhealthy, and unhelpful. Your brain is working hard. You're accomplishing nothing. Like we know the negative part of overthinking. But what I really wanted to focus on was not just how overthinking <laughs> It, at the very best is neutral and at the worst makes us completely miserable. But I wanted to focus on not only how we tend to think our way out of or into the bad stuff, but we can think our way into the good stuff. Because what I found so much was that, I don't know if you relate to this as a man, I don't expect you to speak for all men everywhere, but I know that when I talk with women about how we can really think ourselves out of happiness on a regular basis, like you can see every room or every head in the room nodding. And I really wanted to focus on how we could think our way into good things, not just cut loose the negative, but also really embrace the positive. One of the things that struck me was this idea that overthinking is very similar because it's all up in your head, although it can, it definitely involves your emotions too. Let's not, I don't want to downplay that and just say it's all a head game. No, it's your thoughts and your feelings together spiraling in one direction, which is usually not positive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and What's crazy about that is in there's a similar thing that goes on in the productivity world where a flurry of thoughts and feelings towards something doesn't necessarily mean you're working on something or getting anything done. It can feel like like I mean, we often the term is busy work um, or, you know, when especially for people who are doing knowledge work, you know, where it's numbers or it's looking at screens all the time that it feels like. In, at the end of the day, like, what did I accomplish? And, and that is a similar feeling slash thought process that you get caught up in when we're talking about overthinking. Right. In both cases, you feel like you're on that hamster wheel. Yes, exactly. You're, you're running fast, but you're going nowhere. Yes. And so then one of the best ways that I have found, and we're going to get to this when we talk about deciding what matters, is to kind of allow yourself to do some overthinking, but do it ahead of time in a certain vein so that you've got basically a framework to hold things, you know, to hold up against when decisions come up or when things uh, break or suddenly change and you've got to be flexible and last minute decisions need to happen. And you're like, well, no, wait, I can't I can't make last minute decisions. I've got to gather more information. I need to know like and it's got to be perfect. And so if it's not what I planned on, <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? I, I'm spiraling well, yeah, now did, like six overthinking triggers. Right. right exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it's got to happen now. It's got to be perfect. I don't have the information. I got to find out more. Yeah. And, and, and actually, so this is a great place to, to insert this thought uh, or question. How can you know then if somebody's listening to this? Well, I don't think I'm an overthinker and I don't want to have anybody out there decide, oh, I, I, I'm not an overthinker. And now that I listen to you, I am because I think there's probably like a spectrum here. But I, I've got to ask, how can you know if you're an overthinker? What I wanted to do in the book was share all the different ways overthinking can appear in your life because like we were just saying, the first step to change is awareness. And if you don't realize you're doing something and if you don't realize it's problematic, if you don't realize there's a better way, then you wouldn't know to change anything. So what I try to do is show the different ways that overthinking can manifest in your life. Um, what I've heard people say already in reaction to the book is that they didn't realize the tie between perfectionism and overthinking. So all of a sudden they sit down to, I don't know, buy a new microphone for their workplace or they how about let's do something a little more relatable. They sit down to buy some new earbuds and 45 minutes later, they're like, hold on. I just realized I spent 45 minutes looking for the perfect $11 earbuds when I ended up buying the same thing I looked at on the second click. Like... I didn't need to do that with my life and now I'm tired and want a snack and don't feel like going back to work. Like I totally overthought it. I've also heard an area that people miss a lot is they don't think they're an overthinker, but then they have to make a decision about money. Uh, for many people, 
money is a huge area where overthinking can get Mm -hmm. out of control really quickly. Many of us may feel like we don't struggle with overthinking much of the time, except for this one or two areas in our lives that consistently trip us up. And just having our eyes open to that and getting some ideas for what we could do instead, like what a better way might look like, um, can really change things. And you're getting at the crux of it there. If we're in autopilot all the time, if we're not, and this is where self-awareness comes in, if we're not self-aware of where those trip wires or things that trip us up on those, maybe it, maybe we're not feeling like we're an overthinker because it doesn't hit us all the time. It only hits us with certain things. Then by being able to be aware of those things, we can then start to catch ourselves and say, whoa, oh, wait, uh, I just tripped on this. I started overthinking. I cycled down into it. And now I know that I need to do some work in this one area. Yes. And actually, I learned something really interesting in the course of writing this book. And that is that I, when facing big decisions in my business, I I knew that I was inclined towards analysis paralysis. But what really opened my eyes to how I was inviting overthinking into my life, like actively making things harder on myself, was when a wise person pointed out to me that I am intellectually curious. And just because I enjoy it, I tend to look for more information and more information when I'm facing a decision, uh, maybe a decision about my business. This has certainly happened time and again in the last couple of years, although I'm doing better these days now that I know. But because I enjoy learning things and I think our field is interesting, I'd seek information far beyond the point where it was helpful to me. I was just pursuing knowledge for the sake of knowledge, which meant that it was time to make a decision. I had so many more variables to consider. I had so many more facts to take into account. And some decisions require serious, in-depth, long-term consideration. Um, but I kept going way past the point of gathering information that I <laughs> that I actually needed. And I just overwhelmed myself. And when you are suffering from analysis paralysis, uh, you're, you can't make a decision because you are overwhelmed with information. Um, and when you're overwhelmed, you can't decide anything. So just realize that I brought this information overload on myself and that was completely unnecessary, but also of my own doing. Let me choose a better way. And now it's much easier to make decisions in my work because I don't do that anymore now that I know that it's hampering me. So let's take a minute, two minutes tops and kind of put a time limit and say, okay, let's talk about Enneagram for just a second here (laughs) because I know you're a nine, but I'm a five and fives Mm. are all about gathering and hoarding information. So imagine how it is for me when it comes to making a decision. I've got to research things from every angle just to create a framework of the, uh, you know, understanding the issue. And, you know, before I can even start to say, well, now I'm in decision making mode. I'm not in decision making mode until, you know, I've thoroughly laid context for everything. Well, okay. first of all, it's not overthinking if you're giving it the amount of thought you want to, whatever that looks like. That's good. That's good. Okay, say that again. It's not overthinking. If you're giving it the amount of thought you want to in in the process of discussing the contents of this book, there was someone on my team who kept saying, no, there are some things that you want to overthink because they're really important. Like if you're going to get married or if you're going to buy a house or if you're going to change jobs. And I'd say, no, 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 no. It's not overthinking if you're giving it the amount of thought you want to, even if you're thinking about it really hard for a really long time. Um, If my friend buying the earbuds thoroughly enjoyed as a recreational activity, perusing all the options of headphones available today. I'm thinking of my uncle who loved to take radios apart as a kid because he liked seeing what things looked like from the inside, you know, just fascinated with technology. If that's you, go to town. But that does not apply to most of us. So Eric, if you enjoy building these frameworks, if you feel like you need them to make good decisions, have at it. But the question for you, type five, would be to what end am I doing this? Mm. Man. And again, going back to knowledge work, like it, it's all about, again, you just basically chop the word over off thinking, the overthinking. Uh, is it one word? Now I'm, I've got to take a look here. It's not. Well, I think it's one word. I think it's one word. Yeah. So you basically chopped the partial, well, overs, over and thinking are both words in and of themselves. Let's put it that way. But when you put them together, you get overthink. But you chopped them, you separated them. Let's put it that way. And that's, I think, the thing that 
would cause a lot of people to say, I'm not an overthinker because I'm not always an overthinker. Well, I define overthinking as engaging in thoughts that are repetitive, unhealthy, and unhelpful. They do not have to be all three at the same time. But if your brain is working really hard, but you're not accomplishing anything, that is overthinking. Yes. It's, it's the, it's like how the word habit is positive and negative. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes, it is. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, and and that's, I mean, in, in so many ways, that's similar to what we're talking about here is again, it can be a good thing to be intellectually curious. It can be a bad thing if that is uh, a procrastinating um, method for you. Yes. And that is how overthinking can be so insidious. Like we just said that pursuing more information is good until it's bad. I mean, that's sneaky. And it's the knowing when it's bad that takes individual Mm self-awareness. Well, and the good thing is that it comes with practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to go back to something you said earlier. You mentioned just going through life on autopilot. And something I really found in avoiding overthinking was that having areas in our lives where we can click into autopilot mode can help us conserve our limited mental energy um, for the things that really matter because our mental energy is not a limitless resource. We only have so much to spend each day and how we choose to spend it matters. Do you want to spend 45 minutes of it on those earbuds? And yet at the same time, we don't want to be on autopilot when we should be, you know, awake. This sounds so tricky, but what I found is that when, once you have the awareness of what overthinking could look like in your life and you tune into your own behaviors, you kind of watch yourself going through your day, um, it becomes clear real quickly uh, what what habits are serving you well and which ones are just undermining you. Yeah, I was going to say- you can do something about it. Yeah, this is exactly, again, where habits, positive habits and routines uh, come into play in terms of building a scaffolding uh, at first and then a structure to where you are not doing it all on your own willpower uh, again, and most of the time people are talking about habits as if it's like getting to the gym or it's it's weight loss or it's, uh, you know, physical health related or mental health related, not mental health related. But, yeah, I guess that's some of them. But just that, are, uh, this, again, th- that the, the realm that we're talking about right now, thinking our thoughts, the way we look at things, our perspective on things. That is less of a place where someone's going to, say, make a habit, but it's definitely a place where having habits in place and alleviating the mental stress, the emotional stress, the uh, cognitive stress even, is going to allow you then to move past when information overload comes up or analysis paralysis when that flares up or could in the past, I should say. Yes. And over time, um, just one small step at a time, we really do establish new mental habits, new patterns of thought, really, because every time in your life that you engage in a repetitive thought or a fearful thought or an unhealthy thought, you strengthen the neural circuits that made that thought possible. And it's easier to go there next time. But you can roll that back every time you replace one of those thought patterns with something um, a little more helpful to your poor overtaxed mind, it'll be a little easier to go down that path next time. So really over time, the way your mind works can change. Perfectionism. You mentioned that oh, earlier. The worst. And, and yeah. that is, that is, you know, again, that's one that you really had to come to grips with. I mean, how did you, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that the answer is step by step and over time. But other than that, simple answer, is there anything else you want to add to how you move past that? The first step is really perceiving the ways that perfectionism has infiltrated your thought life, if you relate to that, and the ripple effects it has there, like indecision, irritability, and that analysis paralysis you mentioned. Because if you don't realize that perfectionism is affecting the way you live your life, it can exert so much control over your behavior, and you have no defenses. I found that when you identify it and call it what it is, it really deprives it of its power. So if you do find that you are regularly procrastinating or feel like you need to find the very best answer before you move forward, um, if you struggle with completing a project because there's always more you can do, if you see that your eye goes straight to the imperfections of something and not what you mostly did a pretty great job on, um, or if you're a frequent second guesser, like I really didn't understand before the connection between um, regret and second guessing and perfectionism. 
once you understand the connection and you can see how those tendencies fuel overthinking, um, it's so much easier to let that go. But also, I would say that embracing a spirit of experimentation, which is very easy for some business owners because it's what they do. I mean, my husband used to work at a software company where they embraced the iterative iterative, I can't say that word, where they embrace the iterative approach. They didn't want to create a perfect version of anything the first time because it takes a lot of time and energy and money to make something perfect. So first you have to figure out if it's worth doing perfectly. So you engage in an experiment, you see how it goes, you adjust accordingly and you move on. Being able to look at my own life and the decisions I make, whether that's in my personal life or my business or whatever, and think, let's just try it and see what happens. Like any outcome I get is data. Like this is just an experiment. It's <laughs> it's not a huge deal. It really helps you lower the stakes. And when you don't feel so much pressure, you really can make better decisions and you're free to move forward. If you're just trying an experiment, there's no analysis paralysis because you don't have to get it right. You just have to see what happens next. So much easier. And it's such a less stressful way to live. Well, and, and it also also kind of lets you indulge the analysis a little bit because you're doing an experiment. Exactly. And it lets you, <laughs> it gives you a kind of critical distance that lets you see the topic at hand in a slightly different way. I want to pivot here. And I've, I've kind of alluded to this twice before, allowing yourself to do long thinking or over, you know, I'm trying to think of what the best way to put this is, is just thinking a lot about something without overthinking it ahead of time allows you to land on what is it that matters most to you, your values? Yes. Something that really surprised me in my research was how many times I would talk to people whose decision-making styles I admired and who lives, whose lives seem to have a kind of coherence and integrity to them. I was shocked by how many times they use the word values or values driven when they describe their decision making process. And this is something that I have changed the most in my own life after writing this book. Um, I have really come to be able to articulate my own values. I mean, I always knew what I cared about, but now I can articulate them for the precise purpose of decision making. And I'm learning more and more how to rely on those values when it comes time to make a decision. And I know that that sounds really philosophical and esoteric, but it is such a lifesaver. Um, like just last week, we were invited to go out with friends on short notice at the end of a busy week. We hadn't seen some of these friends in a long time. And I thought, it's cold and it's rainy, and I would ra rather stay home. But the kids were fine. They just wanted to watch a movie. They're old enough to stay home. Um, we hadn't seen these friends in forever. We were able to go. We just didn't want to go out in the rain. But one of our professed values in my house is we show up for the people we care about. And we prioritize spending time with the people we love. And so we could look at the calendar and be like, we can totally do this. The rain is negatively impacting our decision making process. We value showing up. Let's go. And we did. And we were so glad we did. But that's the kind of decision that a couple of years ago, I would have just tortured myself going, I really don't want to go out in the rain, but I kind of want to see them mostly, but I really don't want to go out in the rain. And I just look at those two facts and just get stuck, which sounds silly, but that didn't realizing it was silly. didn't help me think my way out of it. You know, I just finally flip a coin at the end of an hour of deliberating and do something, which actually sometimes just pick something is an amazing strategy for cutting through analysis paralysis. Um, yeah, yeah t totally. If you, if you don't have something, you know, if you don't have a, some sort of values, pre predetermined, sat down, thought through decision making rubric that uh, you've crafted or created according to your values, you know, if you don't have something like that, heck, even if you do, sometimes it's random, it's last minute. You need to not think about it too hard. You just need to say yes or no, because neither way, uh, you, you need to be able to say yes and do the thing without regret. And you need to be able to say no and not do the thing without regret. Also, something that we tell ourselves is that we err on the side of showing up, which built into that phrasing is we don't always get it right. But if we're going to make a mistake, this is the direction we're going to make it in. And that's. So, I mean, it just really frees us up to be like, eh, we won't always get it right. But if we follow this plan that we already decided about in advance, then most of the time we'll be happy with the outcome. Yeah, man. 
I love this. I, another, I love oh, this. I, re- I just got to say, I really, really love this because this was something that um, a friend of mine and I, he's in my mastermind. We, we, we've been talking about this and, you know, we're recording this early in the year of 2020. And, you know, that's when that's when the whole time of year or even the, the closing out of the previous year, everybody's talking about what are your goals for the next year? Like, what are your words for the year? What are you what are you going to crush this next year? And it's like, aside from the fact that I don't love the idea of like spending a whole bunch of time during the winding down time of the previous year, which is, I think, a necessary thing. And that's a great time to sit and think and and do appropriate amount of time thinking. But uh, just this whole setting something up or checking in on or even creating new values or revisiting the values you already have is a great place to be able to then say, I now have what my lens for the year is so that like, for example, what you're saying, air on the side of showing up. So this is a, you know, not that you have to name it the year of showing up or anything like mm-hmm. that. But, you know, you know, there's somebody out there who's like, oh, no, this is the year. This is the year of showing up. And I'm not knocking them. Sorry. There's just so many people that talk like this. We're in the online space. So it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of easy to say that's that kind of stuff. But it, it's not wrong. You can you can say, no, now moving forward, I'm you know, that is one of our values was to err on the side of showing up. We're going to show up more is kind of the intent there. Uh, moving forward. Yeah. Here, let me give you an example that doesn't sound so uh, (laughs) Pinteresty. (laughs) It doesn't sound like it should be on a motivational poster with the sunset. A a pre-made decision I have in my own life is I, I, my business is built around books and reading Uh, my blog, my podcast, my, my book club member site. Like we believe in helping people get more out of their reading life and believe that when you get more out of your reading life, you get more out of your life. This means that I read a lot and I read a lot for work. And after one frustrating experience a couple of years ago where I, 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 Eric, I have so many books in my life. I don't love to bring books into my life that I'm not going to enjoy because I, that means that I have to take them to the library or to the school or to the drop off or someplace later to get them out of my house again, or we will literally be buried in books. But after waiting on a library book and waiting on a library book and reading something at the last minute all in a rush and realizing it was the perfect book, but I could have found this out three months ago if I just bought it, I decided that if I need a book for my work, then I am just going to buy it. Like I am a miser by nature. I don't like to spend money unnecessarily. Um, but financially, this is something that my business can afford. It makes sense. Like books are what we do. And I decided that if I need a book for work, I do not overthink it anymore. I just buy it. And I buy it at my local bookstore if they have it. And if I have time to wait, then I'll have them bring it in. And if I don't have time to wait for whatever reason, I'll buy it online. So I know where I'm going to get it. And I know that I'm going to buy it. And I can't tell you how much overthinking that has saved me in, in my business. So, you know, I, and I know that oftentimes when we use the word value or values, we're talking about like, it, it's got, it's a heavy word. It's a very, you know, lots of lots of meaning is is yeah. uh, you know behind that word. You're and I not think ta- that can scare people. Yeah, yeah, and and what you just described was it's a value in terms of time and financial, which are two really also heavy things. Time, especially with with productivity, financially, we've touched on a little bit on this show before. Um, but you didn't you didn't like make it some. I don't know, like it's some like one of the Ten Commandments, in other words, it doesn't have to carry that weight when you make, you know, a quote. I mean, I'm, not, I'm hesitating to use the word rule, but it's the closest <laughs> it's the closest to what I have to start with in terms of decision making rules. But it's not it's it's more uh, again. These are this is the gosh, the, the decision making guidelines, I guess, or, you know, my pre thought <laughs> decision, my, my already pre thought decision. Right. Well, and something own. something I discovered that is no surprise to your listeners, but uh, it, the implications are enormous, is that making these decisions ahead of time can save so much enter- mental energy so that you have it available to think about the things that require thought that really matters. And these can be huge things like you know, go, uh, I was going to say, go to church. I'm not going to say that these could be huge things like fly across the country to the family reunion, or they can be tiny things like walk the dog a block before 4 PM. Cause you know, you need to get out of your chair. Um, so they can be, they can be these really lofty, deep, important values, but they can also be really practical. 
like go up five flights of stairs a day. Oh, that's a terrible example for overthinking. Cut me, cut me off at practical. <laughs> well, it, it, the practical, it, it, here's the thing. What you just described is, again, going back to where habits fit into this is, again, in talking with my mastermind about this very topic, which was why I loved that this was kind of near the end of the book and the landing place somewhat of uh, where the book was going in the end. I was really encouraged to see that a lot of what has been going on in my own head and in the conversations that I've been having with my mastermind was where this book was kind of landing, which is, and we've even echoed it here on this conversation, has been this idea that it's not a bad thing to think a lot. The appropriate amount of time that's thinking is not overthinking. If it's the appropriate amount of time, it's that it's what you said earlier, and I, I wish you actually, if you can say it again right now, <laughs> it's kind of a mantra for the show. Yeah, yes. it's not overthinking if you're giving it the amount of thought you want to. That's, that's it. That's fine. That's it. You know, I keep, I love Annie Dillard, the writer, and she wrote in one of her essays about the writing life, actually. How we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. What we do with this hour and that one is what we are doing. So I like that because it addresses not only the harmfulness of something like rumination, which nobody enjoys that. That is unhealthy, unhelpful. It makes you feel miserable. But overthinking also carries this opportunity cost. And we only have so much time to think each day and how we choose to spend it matters. So if what you're thinking about is what you want to be thinking about for this moment in your life, then that is absolutely fantastic. Nobody should tell you not to. But when you spend your time thinking about things you don't want to be thinking about, that is what you're doing with your life. And I mean, I hope for better for you than to feel like you're stuck thinking about the things you don't want to think about. Because not only does it make you miserable in the moment, it's at the expense of everything else you could be doing, you could be thinking about instead. And again, the overthinking, the the spinning of your wheels unintentionally drains you to where you don't have this, you don't have the energy to think or act on the things that you want to think and act on. And in fact, that's where that's where I was going was this is such a tie in to what we were talking about earlier with habits is that now if you take the time, I mean, this is this is retreat worthy right here, personal or otherwise, to go and take some time and sit and think on purpose, the appropriate amount of time to decide you know, where are the things that I've bumped up against recently? Where have been those trip ups and where are those places that I need to create a value, but then not only create a value, but create maybe a tiny little cheat or habit or something that then is on autopilot in a good way to where you're not draining yourself and fighting against yourself or others to make that value live out in your life. And then suddenly you've disabled and disconnected the wiring on so many of the triggers that spin you off into the direction you shouldn't be thinking about. Yes, that's so true. And in the book, I talk about how to fact check your values is what I call it. Um, Because a lot of times, okay, I, I do books and reading. And I talk to a lot of people who say, oh my gosh, I think that's so important. And I feel terrible that I never actually read. Well, Eric, that's not living out your values. And um, something that my husband Will did that I really liked was that he created this Google Calendar because we use Google Calendar for our family stuff. And we say that we value showing up for the arts in our community. They're showing up again. Um, but on any like random evening, like we wouldn't we wouldn't want to go to the book signing or we would we, we'd be kind of tired to go to the concert or we decide like, do we really want to buy tickets for this? I don't know. We have a busy month. Um, so he created this arts calendar where you can it's purple and you can load the calendar and see at a glance how much purple there is or isn't. And that's just, that's a very concrete, practical, visual example. But there there are ways to look at your own life and say, do I just say I value these things or am I actually living that out? Um, and if you're not living that out, something should change. Either your, your values are different than you thought. And if you can articulate those, then you will be able to purposefully live those out more clearly. Or there's a gap between what you value and what you're actually doing. And the better your calendar reflects your priorities, the happier you're going to be, but also the easier it is to make decisions. Because that's really the genius there. When your actions are consistent with what's happening in your head, it's just so much easier to make decisions. 
Well, and this is what ultimately is the ripple effect that ultimately when it comes down to you being the person that you want to be instead of shortchanging yourself and creating that world in which you uh, want to live in it and be part of it, then this is how that happens. It's by naming these things. It's by creating the space and creating yourself to be who you want to be and moving towards that. I know, I mean, you've named off already a number of different instances where you and your family have decided this is the way it's going to be. And again, you may err, but at least you're going to err towards doing something about it. Yeah. And that's been so helpful um, because you've got the pre-decision, you've got the (laughs) the space to screw up. You've got the spirit of experimentation. Um, And something that I want to make really clear is that since I first learned about what this, I think I must have heard about values-based decision-making before, but it sounded so ephemeral. Like I just didn't understand how to put it into practice, but um, little by little, seriously, tiny step by tiny step, um, it, it comes into focus and it, is so much easier to make decisions when, when you get there, but it's not like what, it's not like everything clicks into place in an instant. It's just small step by small steps, but each small step feels really good. So once you start on that journey, I think it's really self-enforcing because you feel the benefits. Um, and I got to throw in now, one of my favorite writers is my fellow Kentuckian Wendell Berry. Um, he writes about things like the ecological health of our world and how we can tend it with care. And he wrote something about um, caring for our waterways that really speaks so much to overthinking. He talks in one of his books about how small destructions add up and finally they are understood collectively as large destructions. And I thought that in encapsulates overthinking so well, like spending too much time thinking about how you're going to buy the earbuds. That is not catastrophic. But if that's just one instance that's repeated hour after hour after hour in your day, then the opportunity cost for that is enormous. That's something that nobody wants to pay. I mean, think about what else you could be doing with your life. But I've come to understand that it can also work in reverse because even though those small destructions add up, so can small reclamations. So I would just really encourage all the listeners to look for those tiny acts of renewal that they could incorporate in their own life. Just little ways to think about the things that matter and to let go of overthinking. And the ripple effect on that can be enormous. Well, you just... uh brought it back around to something that I was thinking of, uh, which was, you know what? I just a minute ago or, you know, five minutes ago said, this is, um, uh, retreat worthy. You should go away and like, come back figuring out all the have and have figured out all the values. And I'm like, you know what? I don't want to put that pressure on you. What I do want to call out is you had a specific instance with the book with the three months and you realized something and then decided to make a small change right then and there. And I think that's how it's more practically small scale, brick by brick played out in real life. Yeah, it's so true. And when I talked about these small acts of reclamation, just deciding that we're going to err on the side of showing up or deciding that we're always going to buy 10 bucks worth of whatever from somebody who comes to our door or deciding that we're always going to pick up the trash when we walk by it on the sidewalk or, wow, I feel like we sound really goody goody now. I know, I know. (laughs) Deciding, deciding that we are, well, here, let me give you an example. Um, In the book, I tell this story about how I had been stumped over this decision about whether um, Will and I could go to Scotland for a really cool trip with friends. Um, I hate to fly and being gone from my family and my work during the time of year we went is really, really challenging. And that's why I was thinking of not going. For everyone who's like, why would you not go to Scotland? (laughs) It was not an easy decision. But finally, because of my values, um, we ended up doing it. And you can read about that in the book, but that's not the detail. So we're talking about a big deal, right? Like a week in a foreign country, long flights, money, all that stuff. But one of my regrets from that trip is not... Well, we were at this tiny little cafe in the in rural Scotland and we'd stopped and they had a Bakewell tart. I mean, Eric, do you watch the Great British Baking Show? That admittedly is not my thing, but it is my daughter's. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter if it's your thing or not, but anyone who knows about British 
sweets and treats or who's watched the Great British Baking Show knows that big vault tarts show up all the time. And I'd never seen one in real life. And I was like, oh, it's a big vault tart. And I was delighted. But I don't eat a lot of sugar. Like it's, I know that it's not good for my overthinking. It fuels latent anxiety. It makes me feel bad. Um, so I don't eat a lot of sugar. So I, I was like, oh, I'd love to try that. But I don't want to waste three bucks and not buy the thing because I'm not going to eat it. And it's just fun that I saw it. And I texted my kids and I was like, I saw a big well tart. And they wanted to know how it tasted. And I had to tell them I didn't buy it. And then I felt really foolish. But, <laughs> but what I realized then was that I had made, uh, so I'm talking about a dessert, right? But I realized, this is so silly. I'm talking about a missed opportunity, a regret I have about a trip, um, not buying a $3 dessert. Like that's a little thing, right? Yeah. But, but I realized that what I'd done was made the decision out of a completely wrong framework for the occasion. I saw a dessert in front of me and I thought, I don't want to eat sugar. So I didn't buy it, but I was in a foreign country, like having a completely, like having an adventure, trying new things. Yeah. And it was only three bucks. And so that was my miser self kicking in because I'm a natural born saver. Um, but I realized when we're talking about values that thinking about like, what is the underlying decision here? Or is there a question behind the question that could help me see the matter in front of me more clearly? Um, Eric, that was a $3 Bakewell tart, but it really changed the way I approach a lot of decisions because it made me realize that the question wasn't, do I or don't I want to buy this dessert? It's what, what is really going on here? It was, do I want to have this new experience really? Like I'm having an adventure. So like this was a sensory part of that. And it's really caused me, that little thing has caused me to see things in my everyday life a little differently. So when we talk about identifying values, I know a lot of times they, we're talking about huge things, but they can also be as simple as, does my business need a $20 tool like me and my books? And do I want to make a decision now about, about what I'm going to do when that happens? Or what's the question behind the question? What different lens could I apply to the situation that might snap me out of my paralysis when I'm stuck? Just learning the different ways we can approach decisions and how they can, how they can be sneaky and how we can deceive ourselves sometimes, um, has been so, so helpful. And the more that I've noticed overthinking in my own life and the lives of those around me, the easier it has been to make little tweaks that I don't have to think about anymore. Like I've just started naturally adapting patterns of thoughts that have been so much less exhausting on a regular basis. Yeah, see, that's a that's an exactly great place to land and say, again, this isn't some big grandiose like over, life overhaul change thing. It's small, it's situational, it's practical, but the implications of it are huge if you allow yourself to put in the time slowly but surely as things like this come up. So. I, yeah. I, I want to point people to the book. Um, you know, this is going to drop right around the time the book is coming out and it's out. And so uh, is there any direct place you'd love to send people uh, to either learn more or get a sample or just to flat out just buy it? Yes. All that information is at overthinkbook.com. So there are links to buy it and you can read a little bit more about the book there. Perfect. Awesome. And let's not wait until the next book to have you back on. I'm sure there are other topics, although you're super busy recording your own shows and writing your own things and showing up on other people's shows, I'm Eric, sure. But one of my values is talking to you on a regular basis. Oh, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> well, we're definitely going to do that. So I will make a note to come back around and circle back on this conversation. But thanks for being here this time. And we'll talk again soon. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Well, that's another podcast crossed off your podcast listening to do list. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Ann Bogle. Are you an overthinker? I, I, you know, I am. I definitely am. I think that I may be getting better. I know that going through the book helped me. I think it'll help you too. Honestly, go ahead and grab it. The book's out now as of this release date. I'll link up to it in the show notes, which you'll find at beyond the to do list dot com slash three one five. If you know an overthinker who also needs to hear this episode, please share this with them. Do me that favor. 
hit that share button in your podcast player app of choice where you're listening to this right now. Thanks again for sharing. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you next episode.